Okay, trying for the third time. Uh, syncing video and audio. Go. Uh, let's get this presentation up. Let's go. Hello. Very sorry I can't be in Berlin this week, uh, but I'm really glad to have this opportunity to talk. Um, I hope uh, this will be interesting nonetheless. It might be a bit looser uh, than it would have been otherwise, uh, but I'm going to try and tell a few interesting stories. Uh, that will hopefully give some give you some stuff to think about and perhaps to discuss if you're watching this live and can join us for a, for a chat and a conversation afterwards. That would be great. Um, I'm going to talk about a few things. I'm going to talk about um, this thing, this book that I wrote called The New Dark Age and what that's about and particularly this idea of what I call uh, computational thinking. Uh, I'll explain that a bit in a minute. Uh, I'm going to talk about that a little bit and then I'm going to talk about... Um, what comes after that, essentially? It's a couple of years since I wrote that book. Um, uh, I and, and I think the entire planet are trying to get out of what I describe in that book. Uh, we're obviously in a very uh, critical moment for thinking about that now, so this is a, a nice opportunity to do so. Um, and then I'm also going to expand a little bit right at the end on what I'm thinking about now um, and, uh, and how that comes out of, of these thinkings, thinking about computational thinking and other things. Um, but let's start by looking at kind of where we are now uh, in terms of the things I've been thinking and writing about. Um, for a long time I've been interested particularly in this figure of this thing we call the cloud. Um, when we talk about the cloud today we usually mean the computational cloud. Uh, this, this otherness of computers that we're connected to frequently and, and yet we, we never see and we rarely question. Um, and because that form of kind of difficulty of seeing, not full invisibility, but making a thing hard to see, is one of the ways in which power works. Um, it seems critical for people who are interested in, in the way in which technology operates power to kind of bring that cloud down to earth a little bit, to try and think about what it is, uh, to try and understand why we think of the cloud both as computers and as something that we don't have to think about think about its, its history. And so myself and, and lots of other artists in the last few years have been doing um, a lot of work to materialize the cloud, to think about what it's really made of, of uh, realizing that it's made of machines, of, of computers in, in buildings, of data centers connected by cables, to understand it as a material thing. Uh, and that's really, really important work. And I, I really enjoy a lot of the work that's been done there. But I also think it's important to in the present moment kind of turn the cloud over once again to think about what it means for it actually to be cloudy, to be hard to think, uh, to realize that maybe the, 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 to treat the cloud purely as something computational is to fall into the same trap of this thing that I call computational thinking that's kind of got ourselves into this problem in the first place. So how do, we, how do we understand this problem of computational thinking and how do we start to think our way out of it? Well, I like to think of it as a history and it's a history that's deeply bound up with clouds and particularly with, with the weather. Um, so here's one way of understanding computational thinking. Um, in, the, in the 1910s, there was a guy called Lewis Fry Richardson, a bit of a hero of mine. Um, he was a meteorologist. Um, uh, and he performed a number of experiments at observatories in, in Britain before the war uh, where he was trying to think about how, how you could expand meteorology not just to respond to the weather but to predict it better. Um, and he had this idea that if you gathered enough data about the world uh, that you might be able to figure out some calculations, some little piece of mathematics, what we've come to call algorithms, which would enable you to, to calculate the weather in the future, which no one had really managed to do before. There were lots of rules of thumb, but there was no solid calculation. And he started gathering the information to do this, and then the First World War happened. And in the First World War, Richardson was a Quaker, um, which meant he was a pacifist, which meant he was a conscientious objector. And he went to the front lines of the First World War as a stretcher bearer. While he was there, he took with him all of his data from the war, uh, from, the, from before the war, of a single day's weather data. And he devised these, these algorithms for calculating it. And during the war, with pencil and paper, taking months at a time to calculate a single day's forecast, 
he figured out these algorithms for calculating the war and he wrote a book in 1922 called um, Weather Forecasting uh, by Numerical Processes and, and I'll show you a picture of the, the grid that he drew over Europe and this is what it looks like to divide the world up into sets of squares to take readings in each one and then to use an algorithm to calculate forwards into the future. Now as I said like you know, this, this was an amazing feat of mathematics, but it didn't get us very far because there weren't really computers yet. And without computers, the idea of computing the weather was, was a kind of, was an intellectual exercise. Richardson, as I said, took several months to calculate um, uh, the weather 24 hours ahead. And for years, these ideas were kind of a nice idea that existed only in a book. But then another war came, and, and the Second World War came, uh, and in, in that war, uh, computers started to turn up. In fact, um, one computer in particular, the ENIAC, um, uh, which was really the first uh, stored program digital computer, one of the contenders for the term first computer. And what the ENIAC allowed us to do was to run Richardson's calculation faster than the weather itself. Um, and so what a bunch of American meteorologists uh, and, and, and computer scientists did is they performed the same exercise. They cut the world up into, um, or North America, into a set of squares. They collected the data. They ran that data forwards uh, through a computer program. And uh, effectively, they, they calculated the weather. Um, and again, it took them several weeks, but when they added the time of all the calculations, the time the computer was actually running together, uh, it came to 23 and a half hours. And um, the person who, who was in charge of that experiment um, wrote, like, Richardson's dream has been completed, that, that computation now runs faster uh, than the weather itself. And this is a kind of incredibly landmark moment. Um, it's this moment when we realize that we can run computers faster than the world. And it's the moment that a kind of thinking enters into the world that the world itself is calculable. That given enough data, that given the right algorithms, we can predict the future. And the thing about predicting the future is it always becomes then a matter of controlling the future. It, it says on the one hand that the future is predictable, that there is one future that we're all heading towards, and if only we had the right maths we'd figure it out. And also it says that whoever has that maths will control that future, because they will know what is going to happen and be able to act ahead of everybody else. And everything else that's happened since then, particularly in, in, in computer science and technology, has served to uh, reinforce that belief. Um, in particular, the kind of technological advances we've had in the last um, uh, kind of uh, 50, 60 years, uh, particularly in the development of, of microchips, has served to reinforce this. This is Moore's law. This is a, um, a graph of the power of computers, the, the number of um, calculations that a, the computer is able to perform on a single chip. And back in the 1950s, Gordon Moore um, of Intel predicted that this would double roughly every kind of 18 months to two years. And it was just a kind of a rule of thumb, uh, but it was a prediction that turned out to be correct. Computers have got twice as powerful every 18 months to two years uh, ever since they were invented, which is uh, an extraordinary thing, um, which has which has become a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy that has led us to believe that there will always be more computing power in the future and therefore we will always be able to solve these problems in the future, that we will be able to predict ever more. And it's this, this belief in the ever-growing power of, com of calculation that again reinforces this belief that everything is predictable and everything that is predictable is controllable. Um, all of this goes back down to the kind of very formative um, basis of, 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 of and development of computation itself. But unfortunately, um, what seems to be happening, and I'll tell, explain this in a few different ways, but what seems to be happening is, is this belief that's kind of gone so deep into our heads that we don't question it anymore, and that we've built into all of our machines, and, and therefore into our entire way of life, uh, is failing, is starting to come apart. Um, uh, with, with very obvious uh, consequences. 
Uh, here's one of the places where it's it's falling apart. This is a this is a, a graph that doesn't go up and to the right. It goes down and down, down. Um, uh, this is the uh, a graph of um, uh, money spent on uh, drug discovery, on on the identification of new drugs in pharmacology um, over time, um, uh, against results, against new drugs discovered. And so what this graph shows is that for more money and more time and you know experience that we're putting into discovering new medicines, um, we're getting less and less back. Um, and there's a few ways this has um, uh, been explained. Um, it's called Erum's Law, by the way. That's what uh, scientists in, in pharmacology call it. They call this Erum's Law, which means Moore's Law backwards, essentially, because it's doing the opposite thing. The more computers we throw at the problem, the harder it gets to find new solutions. Um, because that's how they find drugs today, essentially. They just throw loads and loads and loads of computers at the problem. Um, it's probably worth noting at this point that, that despite the problems with this approach, it does obviously hold out um, some of our best hope uh, for finding a vaccine for the coronavirus. Um, but I think what it also points out is that computer-driven discovery in the way that's performed in the pharmacological sciences, and it will be performed on the coronavirus day, is, is not enough. Uh, unless it's allied to um, a huge exercise uh, of, of humanity, um, of, of solidarity, uh, and social practices that must surround all of this computation and scientific activity to make it actually work out. But I might come back to that a little bit later. Um, this is to say, sorry, a room's law again, um, is to say that we're starting to realise that in many ways the application of huge, huge amounts of uh, computation to a problem like drug discovery is not actually turning out to be the best thing. Um, this is the other place, of course, that huge amounts of technology applied to things are not helping us very much. Um, in fact, this is, this is where we can see that that problem of technology is returning to, the, to prevent the predictability of the very thing we set out to predict in the first place, which is the weather. Um, these are uh, diagrams of um, turbulence over the North Atlantic. Um, this, these graphs show that uh, in the current period, the air masses over the North Atlantic are becoming increasingly turbulent, are becoming more bumpy. This is because um, of, of climate change, of the warming atmosphere. As the atmosphere goes warmer, it becomes less stable. Um, and and the, these large masses of air move against each other, creating turbulence. So flights, if you're you know, lucky or stupid enough to take one uh, in the near future, um, are, are becoming more bumpy. It's a direct result of climate change uh, that's occurring in the present, that you can already feel in your body um, if you travel by, uh, by plane. Um, and, and That is a result, as I say, of, of this graph, uh, which, we, which we know uh, all too well. Here's another graph, like Moore's Law, that goes up and to the right. Um, this is the CO2 concentration as measured at Mauna Loa in Hawaii uh, since uh, 1955, that shows the gradually rising concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, uh, one of the key drivers of, of global uh, heating. What a lot of people don't necessarily know about carbon dioxide, it's not just bad for the atmosphere, it's really quite directly bad for us. Um, you might know that a couple of years ago, CO2 passed 400 parts per million in the atmosphere. Um, but actually, if you're um, uh, in a, I would usually say if you're in a crowded lecture hall, but if you're in an office or in your bedroom or in a sitting room with, with the windows closed and the heating on, uh, the carbon dioxide might easily go past a thousand parts per million. They, they've measured classrooms all over Europe and, and frequently find ranges well over a thousand, up to one and a half thousand parts per million, um, regularly occurring in offices and classrooms. And at a thousand parts per million, human cognitive ability drops by 
your ability to think clearly to solve problems uh, decreases uh, under higher levels of carbon dioxide and so it seems completely extraordinary to me, to me that that is that is the thing that we're pumping more than ever into the atmosphere just at the moment when we need the ability to solve ever more complex problems it's carbon dioxide uh, a, a gas that makes us dumber that is that is being pumped continuously into the air and the uh, I see these as being entirely twinned effects the problem of computational thinking which you know combines um, or, or which which convinces us that, that technology alone, technology separated from, from kind of human ways of thinking or human approaches, um, is it will somehow save us or, 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 or bring us together into some kind of uh, uh, more equitable, more just world, uh, which was the kind of early promise of that, however naive it sounds in the present, um, together with, with the, the increased violence and danger of... of the climate emergency. I see these forces being being very directly working together, um, because they both speak to our inability to think differently, and in fact, to be led quite directly into places that are that are highly dangerous to us. If you want to see a place in which the this cognitive crisis is occurring, then then my usual go-to example is a thing called um, death by GPS. Death by GPS is what uh, park rangers. In, uh, in the United States uh, call it when people follow the bright red line on their GPS screen um, into places that they really shouldn't go uh, where they will have documented cases of people driving deep into into Death Valley uh, or even in fact into, um, into rivers and, and into lakes um, because the line on the GPS tells them that that is, is where they want to go uh, that that is where they should go, that this is a safe place to go. And they've outsourced all of their critical decision making to a piece of technology that they believe will, um, uh, that, will that they have full trust in. Um, and it's, it's death by GPS, which has caused a number of deaths, uh, is, a very, is a very serious thing, but it's but also something that we, we might find funny or assume it's connected to stupidity in some way but actually it's connected to something very kind of deep in our brains uh, that actually we're all susceptible to before anyone thinks they're kind of above this uh, it's connected to a thing called automation bias which has been well documented in, in many psychological studies um, the classic example of this study is to put um, a couple of pilots you know um, uh, into a, a plane simulator, pilots with huge amounts of experience, highly trained, uh, understand the, the technology they're using very well, um, have, have you know, gone through many, many simulated situations of this kind, to put them through a simulation in which at some critical moment in, uh, in, a, in a simulated uh, accident event, some automated system tells them that they should do something that they should know they shouldn't do. And yet in 99% of cases, the pilots, despite knowing better, will do it immediately. Because there's some bit of our brain that wants to outsource itself to technology, that wants to take the easier route, that believes ultimately that technology has better answers for us, even if the result of that is... is is driving into a lake or crashing a plane, um, our brains are very highly susceptible to digital suggestion, um, which, which is it's easier to believe when we start to think about, for example, the number of times you're picking up and, and looking at your phone right now, scrolling through it and tapping at things. Um, a lot of that happening is part of a very deliberate kind of attack on your ability to think clearly. Um, this, of course, this this attack on the mind, this attack on society, but also this kind of deliberate harnessing of um, uh, technology and our belief in it, um, uh, obviously finds an expression not just in GPS or experiments, but in, but in the wider world. It's particularly obvious in the case of, of automation, 
um, I think of uh, places that look like this. This is um, uh, the Amazon warehouse in Rugeley in Staffordshire. It used to be, I'm not sure it still is, the largest Amazon facility in, uh, in Europe. Something very interesting happens in this space, something that's very um, significant when thinking about our kind of the transformation of the world around us into something technological, something deeply inhuman. Amazon uses in its warehouses a thing called um, uh, chaotic storage. Chaotic storage is a way of making these spaces more efficient. Because if, like Amazon, you sell a billion different types of things, um, and you know people don't order those things um, uh, alphabetically or by type. You know, people order a book and some laundry detergent, um, you know, and a DVD and, and, and you know, a T-shirt. Um, and if those things are stored as a human would store them in this vast warehouse space with all the books over here and all the laundry detergent over there, anyone who has to pick that order will have to walk for miles to get it. So what they do is they use this thing called chaotic storage, where all those things are actually intermingled seemingly at random but actually according to a very complex algorithm based on people's desires around the space. So you have books next to t-shirts, next to laundry detergent. That makes the whole space hugely more efficient. It also makes that space completely illegible to human beings. It makes that space completely unreadable to human beings. Um, and so the only way to navigate that space in much the same way as, you know, the complexity of our, of our world more broadly today is through the assistance of, of technological devices. And people who work in Amazon warehouses and in many, many other warehouses have to use small devices which they carry around with them that tell them where they go from point to point, like kind of personal GPSs. And of course, as well as making the space more efficient, that also makes a workforce that's easier to hire and fire. You don't have to train that workforce in the same way. Um, you don't have to really command, have any kind of investment in, any, in them at all. Uh, zero, contract, zero hours contracts are very easy. Um, you can monitor their toilet breaks. You can monitor to the second how long they spend at lunch. Uh, you have a, a, a system of efficiency on the one hand for the company and total surveillance for the workforce on the other. Um, and at the same time, a process of, of complete de-skilling. The application of technology in this point clearly makes most people dumber and moves the power up to um, uh, uh, a kind of higher level of, 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 of management of, 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 of the wealthy. Um, that there's absolutely no way in this scenario that you, you could see that this technology would actually be, be kind of empowering people. And yet this is the way in which it's being deployed. Um, and it's being deployed literally everywhere. This is, this is my other favorite example, which um, uh, Sujana Zuboff in her book, um, Surveillance Capitalism, which is pretty good, um, goes into in, in quite some depth. Um, if you've ever seen or played yourself um, Pokemon Go, um, another game where, or another instance in life where you're following this kind of bright dot, this line around a space, um, uh, I wasn't aware. Until, until reading Zubos account, that um, most of the Pokemon gyms, uh, the places that players have to congregate to do whatever they do, um, uh, were pre-sold to, um, to large corporations. So Starbucks and McDonald's and Target and, 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 and whoever else it was, bought the locations of these places so that when people were out collecting Pokemon, they'd be slowly and uh, you know, directly moved through the city towards these retail locations, walked through the doors of um, of various uh, uh, company shops without them even being aware of it. Advertising that's gone from being, you know, billboards trying to persuade us to technologies that literally walk us through the streets because we believe we're following our own desires. Uh, the, 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 the neural kind of connection of that ability has, has gone all the way down. And of course this is, happening, this is happening kind of politically and socially as well. This is the process that's happening through social media. This is the process that's happening through, through news. Um, and these are continue to be processes of prediction and control and computation being utterly intertwined. This is Walter Cronkite. Uh, the veteran American newsreader speaking very 
calmly and clearly uh, on American television in 1980. Um, uh, about climate change, about it being a real thing that we're going to have to act on, that we're going to have to think about. And then on the um, on the other side here, you'll see that what YouTube recommends that you watch next is a series of videos about um, uh, climate change conspiracies, climate change denial, um, sowing doubt, which has been a deliberate policy of, of the oil companies for kind of 30, 40 years. You can read Exxon's memos about this from the 1970s and 1980s, in which they planned a deliberate policy of misinformation. Um, I really recommend, if you've got some time on your hands, listening to the podcast called Drilled, which really lays out this kind of history. Um, but in this case, this is being done by YouTube, which is Google, which is one of the largest corporations in the world. Something really extraordinary is happening here, which is deeply indicative of this thing that I call the new dark age. Um, this, this, this moment in which we can no longer predict and control the future in the way that we did. Um, uh, or, 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 or it has been, the ability to do so has been taken on wholesale by those who do not wish us well. Um, what, what's happening here is that the algorithms which decide what to show you next, which millions and millions and millions of people follow every day, have realized that because their incentive is to get money through clicks, that what they need to do is show more and more extreme content. And, and that extreme content tends to be conspiracy theories. It tends to be kind of the, the fringe of, um, of, of, of political beliefs, junk science, pseudoscience, and ultimately into kind of deep racism and misogyny and everything else we know that's kind of flowered in the dark corners of the internet has flowered because people are being uh, uh, recruited, essentially, through platforms as simple as this, not even by anyone's intent. This is what's extraordinary about this. I'm no fan of Google, but I don't believe they set out to build a platform of radicalization. But they have done it because they have trained an algorithm towards getting more attention. And that algorithm has figured out by itself that the way to get more attention is to show people more extreme content. And so we go from a place where a few years ago, belief in a flat earth was, a, um, uh, was almost entirely unheard of uh, piece of insanity to, be, to a point where thousands, uh, if not tens or hundreds of thousands of people in, around the world take the possibility of a flat earth seriously, just as millions take the, the possibility of global warming being a hoax or increasingly um, a virus being genetically engineered as a reality. These are um, beliefs that are tearing our society apart, uh, that are driven by the unthinking application of technology to our inability to think about technology clearly. There's so many ways in which this is, you know, can be seen to be being done deliberately. And uh, the last example of which I'll mention is, um, is I think the way in which we're, that you can see it so clearly. I think, so, so what, what's super interesting to me about this is the way in which, like, if you look at this directly, it's so obvious that this is the case. The kind of weird effects of technology, because this is the way it always appears at the beginning. This is always described as being something, wow, this is crazy, this is weird, this looks so weird. That weirdness is not an odd byproduct of computation. It is computation. Computation <laughs> is producing a deep weirdness in the world. Um, and our response to that is not to say, oh, that this is some odd side effect that we'll correct, right? That's when the technology has gone wrong. This is in fact, actually what the technology does. It makes stuff weirder. Um, and, and, and for me, it's really important to be able to look directly at the technology and be able to learn that lesson and to be able to say, hey, actually, maybe we should take the fact that this constantly produces weird, uncomfortable, strange outcomes as being indicative of the technology itself rather than some weird side effect that will eventually ever come. And that's no more, you know, that's, that's deeply indicative in what's happening here. That's Bruno, if you can hear him barking. He might just do that for a while. I'm going to keep talking. Um, we, the, the, first, the very first thing that people do when we have access to these new tools of kind of artificial intelligence 
doesn't deserve the name, but it's what we're using, is to produce lies about the world, to make the world uh, less knowable and more complex. And that's that's what you're seeing here in, in these animations. This is um, this is entirely fake faces being generated um, endlessly in infinite numbers. That this is one of the first things we've turned computers to do is to generate fake people, uh, which are then used in fake. Um, news accounts that are used to confuse us and confuse the situation further. Uh, the other thing of course that, that, that AI is, is, is being used for intensely is, is to defeat us. Right? Um, the, the place in which we are testing out all of our artificial intelligence is in, is, in, is in games. In games against humans intended to defeat us. Again, a, a process, a system of disempowerment, of, of uh, removing the humans, one of humanity's most enjoyable things, which is the playing of games, that's what we'll target to um, to improve the machines until they can take everything from us, until they can um, take our sense and our political agency, until they can take our jobs uh, through automation, um, until they can take everything from us. But first they're going to take our, our games and our enjoyment in them. And what, again, what does it say about the forms of technology that we're developing that they immediately are placed in this kind of oppositional stance to us? That they're immediately put in places to beat us in this kind of incredibly aggressive uh, positioning. I, I find that you know, incredibly uh, fascinating, but also incredibly revealing. If there's any sense, if you're ever told that artificial intelligence as being currently developed is here in any way for our benefit, ask what possible benefit um, uh, we will gauge in the long run from intelligences that have been trained from birth to defeat us. Um, that's not an exaggeration, that's not a, a wild thought, that is literally how we're training them as, as oppositional systems. I'll come back to this idea of how else that could be in a while, but I think this is this is partly the most important thing to take very seriously um, the forms of technology that we're developing in the present. To look at them clearly and ask who is making them and who is what are they making them for? How are they being used? And to be very clear-eyed about the effects of those technologies on society, because looking around, it's pretty clear um, that. Uh, this combination of computational opacity, that is a, a generalised lack of understanding of how technologies really function, together with um, the, uh, the centralisation of power that all of these technologies are making possible, um, is putting us into a place uh, where um, uh, where we are um, unable to to think clearly or to change how we're using any of these things. Um, I think the, the the really the really key example of this for me that kind of stands at the centre of computational thinking in the new dark age is is the realization that access to more and more information about the world, being better informed, um, understanding more about the world. Uh, this this idea that has been kind of central to our culture since since the Enlightenment and before um, turns out not to be the case. Having more access to information alone as a pure thing, pure access to information alone, does not improve our lot. In fact, it makes the world harder to understand. It reveals its kind of incredible complexity, um, and a complexity that we clearly haven't got the tools uh, to deal with. Um, we're uh, we, we've spent the last kind of 20 to 30 years destroying many, many kinds of authority. And I'm kind of all for that. I think it's fine to, to knock some authority um, down. Um, but if we haven't replaced it with other ways of thinking along the way, we leave ourselves incredibly vulnerable to, um, to the kinds of, of chaos, uh, fundamentalism, uh, conspiratorial thinking that we find ourselves um, in really deeply in the present moment. So I tried very hard not to um, to insist or even come up with solutions for
for for the situation that we we find ourselves in, in at the present. Um, in fact, I think solutionism is a kind of c computational thinking that's got ourselves into this mess in the first place. So I don't like to think about um, uh, about solutions, um, um, but I, I I do think a little bit about manoeuvres, about the the ways we can turn the different paths we might start down upon um, if we're going to get ourselves out of the mess that we find ourselves in at the present. Um, and these, I'm going to talk about three of these manoeuvres, uh, which are not exclusive, um, but I think are interesting stories that might give us a modicum of hope in the present. Um, uh, and those, those three manoeuvres central upon who owns, operates, and directs the technologies that we're we're sort of discussing? Um, who um, who understands um, and and can use and can shape and change those technologies? And finally, weirdly, who is who in the discussion that we're having at present? So the first those the first manoeuvre concerns who owns, operates, and directs those technologies. Um, because I, 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 none of this, none of this is an argument for getting rid of technology at all. Um, that would be ridiculous, considering we're here right now in this moment, talking to each other across the most extraordinary assemblage uh, that humanity has ever put together, a, a planet-spanning communications network uh, that allows us to, to think at one another in interesting ways. None of this is to get rid of that. Um, but obviously we need to think radically about the forms into which we put that technology. Um, and, and we need to um, think about who it's, who it's directed at and, and, and to what ends it's turned. Um, so the first manoeuvre of the new dark age is essentially to turn the, those technologies upside down. Um, I think particularly of, of, um, of a strange story that happened a few years ago at a NASA conference when um, uh, the, um, I probably didn't happen at a conference, but anyway, um, when the, um, uh, the, the, I've forgotten their name, the, uh, the, the spy agency, not NSA, the next one, the one that does, the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, sorry, um, approached NASA and said to NASA, hey, by the way, um, we've got a couple of satellites we're not using, do you want them? And it turned out that uh, the the secret state had built a not one but two, and obviously many, but had two surplus Hubble, better than Hubble quality telescopes sitting on the shelf um, that uh, that they weren't using, that were surplus to requirements, presumably because they built something a lot better. And they offered these to NASA, and NASA is currently refurbishing those satellites into into satellites for science. Um, uh, the first of which is called W First, the, um, uh, which is an infrared um, uh, telescope for for looking out, uh, looking for other planets. Um, uh, and so instead of pointing this telescope down at the ground, they're going to turn it upside down and look out uh, to look for for new stars and new planets, um, which I just think is the most beautiful. Um, idea of, of what's possible uh, when you actually decide to use particular technologies uh, for us rather than against us, uh, when, that, when the, 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 the aim of these things is turned around. Uh, and essentially that depends largely on, on who operates them and who they belong to. Um, which, which brings me to the second manoeuvre, uh, which is to truly distribute the technologies that we have, um, which can take many forms. This is Paul Buran's classic diagram from the 1960s in which he, he described different forms of networks. And, and we're always, the idea is always that we're sort of getting to see or that the internet is C, but we never got to C, we never got to the distributed one. We kind of really got stuck at B with decentralized networks and to be honest not really that decentralized just with slightly different centers. What's happened with our technologies is over the last 50 years is that um, that the power has been decentralized to corporations, to slightly different bodies, to other bits of the state than it was centralized in before. 
um, and yet no true distribution has really occurred. Um, that distribution will only happen when um, uh, when we're all connected to these networks more equally and the only way that will happen is if we're all uh, more involved in their construction. Uh, if we all really have a deep understanding of how these networks function. Um, so there's a real work at hand to change the way all of us access uh, and um, use these technologies. And two quick examples of how that might be occurred. For example, if this was entirely up to me, this would not be on YouTube. Um, I would much rather this was happening through a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, technology, for example. These are going to become a lot more important. Start Googling now what peer-to-peer -peer technologies are like and start using them. For example, I always use them um, for video chats. Instead of using Skype and Zoom, these large corporate platforms, use peer-to-peer -peer systems like Whereby and um, uh, Jitsi. Right? You can Google these, you'll find them easily. Something really extraordinary happens when you choose to use different technologies. Um, you're still able to do the things that you're doing, the things that we're doing now, the, the talking to one another. And yet, by changing the type of technology you use, which you can do relatively easily if you understand the form of technology that you're using, um, changes the shape of the network itself. Right now, we're giving power to Google by using this stupid, awful box of YouTube in order to communicate with each other. Right? But we don't have to do that. Other networks are available. Uh, other ways of communicating are available. Other technologies are available. The, the knowledge of how to use those requires us to become more engaged, to think more about how uh, how they work and how what the effects of us engaging with them are. They are harder to use and yet the only way to change anything is going to be for us to engage better with them. You have a little bit of time now. Uh, we all do. Let's at least emerge from this using tools that will actually change uh, the shape of the network. Because when you change the shape of the network you don't just distribute the network, you distribute power. We redistribute power. And it's an absolute precursor to redistributing power in the real world, is to redistribute the understanding and knowledge of the tools that we use every day. That's the second manoeuvre. The third manoeuvre, who is who? This is the weird one. Um, but this is the one I'm kind of thinking about the most at the moment. And I hope it gives you a little something to think about as well. I find it very strange, having talked about artificial intelligence just now, um, uh, that the forms of artificial intelligence we're building are so uh, oppositional and so competitive and essentially so narrow-minded, capitalistic and extractive. Right? The, the, that is the form of... We've mistaken capitalism essentially for intelligence. We think that intelligence is uh, a kind of extraction whether it's gathering data, uh, processing that information, beating people at games, making markets more efficient, all of the, none of these are intelligence, right? Well, they're certainly not the kind of intelligence you might recognize if you've been paying any attention at all to the extraordinary discoveries we've been making in the last you know, decade or so about the cognitive abilities of non-human creatures, right? Um, the, what we're starting to learn about the world outside of ourselves outside of the human um, is quite extraordinary and, and really is, is, is still so poorly understood but so brilliant and exciting once you get into it and if and if the main drive within technology is is these forms of kind of corporate capitalist intelligence which are clearly destroying us and if our greatest challenge at the moment over the years decades and centuries to come is clearly to find ways of, of living better on this planet then opening ourselves up to non-human intelligences must be the way that we need to go. Um, and it turns out that that's, that's entirely possible and, and is right at hand. Um, and, and, and what we're starting to realise about the abilities of non-humans will only draw us closer. You might have heard uh, of the, the poster child of, of this kind of slow realisation of non-human intelligence. 
uh, is this. This is the octopus. I'm going to give a few examples of these weird non-human intelligences to finish off this slightly rambling talk. Um, uh, the reason everyone's getting excited about the intelligence of octopuses um, is that um, octopuses are not like us in, in quite important ways. Um, they are um, uh, physically incredibly different. Uh, they're neurologically incredibly different. The, the octopus brain extends into its legs, um, into all of its, uh, all eight of its, of its legs. Uh, half of its brain is distributed uh, throughout its body. Uh, and in fact, it appears that perhaps its legs operate um, independently, or at least in some kind of loose confederation with the, with the cranial brain. Um, so the octopus is less a kind of single individual, but a, a, a collective of, of, of agencies, all doing their own thing and working together to do the things that the octopus needs to do. Um, what's particularly fascinating about the, new, the brain of the, of the octopus is also that it's like other bits of the octopus, so different from us. The oldest known common ancestor uh, of us and the octopus, because we do have one if you go back down the tree far enough, lived 400 million years ago uh, at the bottom of the ocean with some kind of blind flatworm. Um, but as well as brains, octopuses and us both have eyes. In fact, remarkably similar eyes. Um, in fact, um, eyes that are small, round, squishy globes um, filled, with, filled with gel. Uh, and with kind of light receptors on the back. We both have them, and yet our common ancestor didn't have them, which means the eye has evolved twice, separately, up these two evolutionary branches. And the contention then, as we slowly realise the extraordinary abilities that octopuses possess in forms of, in so, forms of communication, in forms of awareness, in forms of problem solving, very good at escaping, that the octopus mind also evolved differently and separately from us, um, and yet it exists. That intelligence, far from being a kind of graduated tree with us and our creations at the top of it, is in fact a kind of flowering uh, thing, a bush, even a cloud, um, of many, many different forms of intelligence. That's what the octopus kind of teaches us. And what gives me hope um, when we're starting to think about other ways, uh, other problem-solving abilities that we need for the future uh, is that we actually have not artificial intelligences but other intelligences here on the planet that we can turn to and think with in order to um, come to some kind of um, uh, better course of action. Um, and and, and realising that, realising that we too are um, networked beings uh, uh, like the, the confederation of octopuses' arms um, that also do not think in any ways like we used to think that we think. Uh, recent discoveries, for example, about the human biome, which is the kind of two kilograms of um, bacteria that we all carry around in our gut, um, has a direct connection to our brain in the fact that the health of our, uh, our gut affects our cognitive ability. Um, just as the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere affects our ability to think, so does the makeup of the other species of organism that live inside and within us. Um, we're not individuals in the sense that we've always thought ourselves to be, at least under modernity. In fact, we're these incredibly networked um, beings composed of, of communities of, of other, other beings at the same time, that we are always in kind of dialogue and communication with, but we've only just started to notice. And we're only just starting as well to notice the forms of communication um, and, and, uh, and uh, solidarity that exist between other beings in the world. This is Pando, the largest forest, uh, the largest possibly individual in the world, which appears to be a forest, but actually is one single clonal individual of um, aspen trees uh, in, the, in the US, uh, an area of uh, kind of 12 to 15 acres of trees that is in fact one single organism working together. And between and the roots of that tree, communication is happening. Uh, between the plants, between the trees, between the fungi, this entire world uh, that um, uh, that some scientists have termed the wood wide web uh, has slowly been revealed to us in the last uh, kind of twenty or so years 
uh, this incredible activity, these, these incredible amounts of communication and exchange occurring all the time um, uh, in gases in the atmosphere and in, in signals and nutrients under the ground, we've only just become aware of. And the final, final thought I'd like to leave you with, uh, in that image of the wood wide web, um, this, this network of communication that exists between other life forms and other intelligences under the ground, it was only in the 1970s when the first uh, research laboratories were hooked up to the nascent internet that um, a, a network discourse entered into the kind of study of mycorrhizal fungal and tree networks. It was only once we built uh, these uh, artificial computer networks drawn diagrams of them, started to understand how they function, that we could start to see and apply these metaphors that we are making to the natural world around us that is so much more important uh, and, and absolutely urgent to understand in the present. The things that we make are here to allow us not to solve the world and certainly not to conquer it, but in order to allow us to think it better, to rethink it. The tools that we use every day are not tools for solving the world. And despite the way in which they're often used, they mustn't become entirely tools for domination. But they can remain uh, ways in which we can rethink and reshape the world around us if we're capable of rethinking them constantly over time. I think I've probably spoken for long enough. Thank you for your patience. Uh, please, again, if you're watching this live, uh, let's have a chat on the live stream because um, I'm uh, almost on my own here and you might be too. So let's have a chat. Thanks very much.